Okay, so sometimes you might find yourself in a situation of having to write your own preconditioner, and you might wonder what are the options that NGSOL gives me, gives me. Well, so there are certain block smoothers that in that can be tuned or customized to to your liking. Um, you can then combine two different preconditioners, uh, existing preconditioners, with your own blocks if you like, all sitting from, from Python. Of course, if you go into the C++, you can do whatever you like. Okay, so let me, sh uh, the, the, the objective in this tutorial is, is to show you some of these facilities to set up things inside Python and then send it into the, into the core code to create preconditioners. So there, there is some boilerplate code that we're always writing, so I'm, I'm just gonna call it inside setup. You take the unit square, mesh it, and take the Lagrange finite element space. And then you have a, some standard bilinear form. Okay, so that's all hidden inside setup, so that I can keep calling the setup whenever I need, okay? Okay, uh, there's nothing exciting about the mesh. It's just the unit square with some mesh, okay? Let's look at how to create a Jacobi uh, preconditioner. Okay, the, the, the Jacobi preconditioner does exactly this. But to understand this, you, you have to recall what, what, this, what this block is. The, the degrees of freedom are classified into free degrees of freedom and constrained Dirichlet degrees of freedom. In the constrained de Dirichlet degrees of freedom, the Jacobi preconditioner does nothing. It, it's just the identity block. In the remainder, oh, it's a zero. Oh. Okay. Zero. There. <laughs> in the remaining, in the, in the in the remainder, and for the free degrees of freedom, it takes a diagonal of of, of the three degrees of freedom, takes the inverse of the diagonals, and, and that's it. So, in order to create this Jacobi preconditioner, here, this is the method you call. A is the bilinear form. A dot mat gives you a uh, NGSOLVES base matrix object, and that base matrix object can can create a, a Jacobi smoother. And once you give it the three degrees of freedom the degrees of freedom that defines this block. Okay, so uh, one other facility, uh, we could of course run a conjugate gradient and look at the uh, number of iterations to see if a preconditioner is effective, but NGSOV also gives you another facility to look at the eff efficiency of preconditioners, which is this eigenvalues preconditioner uh, routine. It computes the eigenvalues of the precondition system if you were going to precondition this matrix with some preconditioner, it does a few land source, land source iterations, uh, collects a few approximations to the extreme eigenvalues, and you can print out those extreme eigenvalues, or you can estimate the condition number by taking the ratios of the m maximum eigenvalue to the minimum eigenvalue. So in this case, with the Jacobi sm smoother, or preconditioner, you see that the eigenvalues come out to something like 2.8 in the extreme, and the smallest eigenvalue is about 0.015. And if you want the condition number, that's okay, about 200. Okay, so at this point, it's, it's, it's useful to ask, what does the Jacobi preconditioner, uh, what did we get out of the Jacobi preconditioner, if anything at all? Because two condi a condition number of 200 is still uh, on the higher side. You want a condition number like 10 or one. So how come we got 200? Well, uh, so what happens if we don't precondition at all? If there is no improvement when we're going to the, pre to the Jacobi preconditioner compared to no preconditioning at all, then we, we should know that. So in order to do the case of no preconditioning at all, we have to plug in instead where the pre where, where we have to plug in preconditioner equals identity. Okay, so we do that here, except in order to get the identity, what we really want to do is to have an identity block on the on the degrees of freedom that are free. So, NGSOL gives you this object. 
This is a projector, and the projector takes as input a bit array, uh, which tells you the, which essentially tells you what is the range in which the projector should project into. So if you give it the free dos, then this projector says, well, I'm going to project onto the onto the, the space formed by the free dos, um, and and that, that gives you a preconditioner, uh, which is the identity preconditioner on the free dos. So we, we we will plug in. Let me initialize this. You could also you could also do identity matrix if that pleases you. Uh, but perhaps this is more clear. The effect of the three degrees of freedom and so forth is more clear here. Okay, so you see that if you did not precondition at all, if you just put in this this identity matrix, then your condition number was 1500. So y you did achieve something by going to the Jacobi preconditioner to get a precondition number, a condition number of 190, about a factor of 10. All right, and, and of course, once you have a preconditioner, you can plug it into solvers.conjugate gradient and, and, and see how many iterations it takes and so forth. Okay. Um, the, the, the next item we should discuss is Gauss-Heidel, is the Gauss-Heidel operator as a smoothing operator or as, as a preconditioner. The smoothing object we created using the create um, let me bring up this this command creates. I mentioned that this creates a Jacobi sm smoother or a Jacobi precondition. This object, this Jacobi object, cannot not only do the application of of this matrix, but it can also do the Gauss Heidel based on the same uh, based on the same uh, diagonal inverse. And for for this, here is an example that shows that. We take the same object that we constructed before, preconditioner J, uh, the Jacobi preconditioner based on uh, point values, it, uh, the point smoother based on based on a decomposition into three degrees of freedom and Dirichlet degrees of freedom. Here is the same projector we saw before. This step. The method called smooth does one step of the gauss idle iteration. Okay. Once you do the gauss idle iteration, you can now run the gauss idle iteration by computing the residual and keep repeating the smoothing operation. And that gives you a, what is called in the field as a, as a linear solver or a, or a linear iter iterative method. It takes a while to converge. Okay, uh, I did 500 iterations. So it's better to put in it, put in this this as a precondition inside conjugate gradient than run it as an in independent linear solver by itself. Okay, uh, gauss idle operator is is not self-adjoint. So in order to combine it within a conjugate gradient iteration where it's expecting a, a symmetric preconditioner, you have to symmetrize the gauss idle. Okay. It, Symmetrization of Gauss idle is very simple. You run the Gauss idle in a certain ordering of unknowns. If you run it back in, in, in the reverse order, you get the adjoint. If you combine these two, you have the symmetrized Gauss idle. So NGSolve makes it easy by providing these two methods, smooth and smooth back. Smooth does it in, in, in the ordering that is currently in, in the mesh. Smooth back does it in the reverse ordering. And if you do, if you do that one after the other, you, you get a, you get a self-adjoint operator. You can, now print, uh, you can make the matrix of this operator, print it out, and you, you'll see that it is symmetric. Okay, let's, we symmetrize the gauss idle and plug it back into the conjugate gradient to see how it performs. <coughs> and in 32 iterations, you have converged. Right. So that's much better than having to wait around for 500 iter iterations of the, of, of the gauss idle solver used as, a linear, used as a linear solver. And if you look at the condition numbers coming out of eigenvalues preconditioner with the, with, with the gauss idle operator, the condition number is around 20. This is, this is now getting competitive. Uh, 
uh, uh, condition number of 20 will, is a nice condition number. Okay, so we can improve the condition number even further. Of course, the best condition number we can get is one, but uh, <laughs> we could get that for the identity matrix, but we're not, we, we want to get as close to one as possible. So let's see wh how far we can go. So uh, how far we can go without saying that the preconditioner is the inverse matrix itself. Of course, we can just invert the matrix and give it as a preconditioner, and then the then A times A inverse is the identity, and that's the best preconditioner, but that's too expensive. So the, the name of the game here is to try to try to come up with with something that has varying degrees of, uh, of expense, but at the same time has varying degrees of efficiency. And, and to understand the trade-offs, that uh, you're able to study all the, the trade-offs very easily using the facilities that NGSOL gives you. So the next item, <laughs> to study is, is blocks. You can make the condition number better by going to block smoothers. But for that, you have to make the blocks. So here, uh, we are going to look at vertex batch blocks. So you look at a vertex, look at all the elements ar surrounding that, that's a vertex batch. And collect all the degrees of freedom around, around uh, uh, collect all the degrees of freedom contained in the elements connected to that vertex. That forms one block, and there's one block per, per vertex, and we want to make these blocks. These are index sets. So here's how we make these blocks. We run a loop over, over mesh dot vertices. Okay, this we, we already know how to do this from uh, the mesh topology section. So we run a loop over mesh dot vertices. We start with an empty set, and then we add to this set, or take the set union, all the degrees of freedom of the element EL, for all elements that are connected to the to the vertex V, so we're using a number of constructs that we saw in the in the previous tutorial. You have mesh, uh, you have the the elements connected to a vertex, the degrees of freedom associated to the element. Add them up, um, take the union of all of them, and you get a set. And these sets are are blocks. So let's print out these blocks. You see, some blocks have three, some blocks have a lot more entries, and so on. So these, not all the blocks have the same size. Okay, now once we have these, these index sets giving the blocks, you send this index set, or the list of index sets into the create block smoother. And that creates uh, a, a block Jacobi object, which can do, again, smooth or smooth back. Let's look at the condition number. Okay, so we have a condition number of 34. Now we symmetrize it using the, the same symmetric Gauss-Seidel business. And then we have a condition number of two, which is better than what we got before with 20. Uh, 2.9, sorry, condition number of three. Yeah, okay. Okay, in order to do any better, you have to go you have to do something, something non-local, a coarse grid correction. So a coarse grid correction uh, involves, <laughs> involves an operator that, that's, that, that spreads out information across the, the mesh faster than these local smoothing blocks can do. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is to take a high order finite element, look at its vertex degrees of freedom, collect all its vertex degrees of freedom, and then restrict the matrix to those vertex degrees of freedom and, and invert that matrix. That will form a coarse preconditioner. Okay, so here, are, here is how we collect all the vertex degrees of freedom. We run a loop over mesh vertices, look at the degrees of freedom corresponding to that, that vertex and form a bit array uh, and, and set, uh, set the bit array vertex stops equals to, to true. And this is a, the a set operation which, which, which tells you on, to, to intersect it with, with uh, three degrees of freedom. So all of that is contained in the simple function. And we'll print the vertex degrees of freedom and you, you get a bit array. The bit array is one where you have a vertex degree of freedom and zero for all the interior and all, all, all other degrees of freedom. And we can pass this bit array to an inverse routine, and that essentially tells the inverse routine, 
to invert the matrix only at these degrees of freedom. Namely, remove all the rows and the columns corresponding to everything that's marked zero here. And when you do that, you get a coarse preconditioner. Okay. Okay, you, there, are, there are things that you can do with the coarse preconditioner and things that, that, that you cannot do. For example, you cannot use a coarse preconditioner as a, as a preconditioner. You have to combine the coarse preconditioner with, with, with uh, a smoothing operation. And uh, there, there is some explanation here that you can read at your leisure. But you get a two-grid preconditioner, which is uh, a standard preconditioner, by combining the coarse preconditioner, which was the inverse on the vertex blocks, plus this, I'm sorry, the, the, the vertex degrees of freedom, plus the block gas idol that we constructed earlier. And to combine them additively is, is trivial in NGSOL, we just do plus. And it takes care of whatever is necessary behind the scenes. Okay, so if we do that, now we have a two-grid preconditioner and you can do, you can look at its eigenvalues and you see that we are pretty close to one for the maximum eigenvalue and about one third or so, I guess. Okay, so uh, two-grid preconditioners are, are often used whenever the coarse preconditioner, uh, whenever you have a coarse preconditioner that's easily accessible. What we just did with inverting the matrix on on the vertex degrees of freedom, uh, it could become very expensive if you have a mesh that is very fine and, and you, have a, you have too many vertices. So instead of the coarse preconditioner, in that scenario, when you have, a, uh, when you have too many vertices, it's better to do multigrid. You can combine with the same block smoother that we saw before, we can combine a multigrid preconditioner. So let's initialize a multigrid preconditioner and let's make the problem size a little bigger because now we are still running with a, with a, with a small problem where just for the tutorial, we did a refine a couple of times. Now we have uh, 100,000 unknowns um, and we do repeat all the same process before, the, the block Jacobi, the block Gaussero. And here we take the multigrid preconditioner, take the block Gaussero preconditioner, add them up together. And now we see that we have pretty much the same condition number as before, except that this preconditioner is much more much more effective, and we ran this over a much larger mesh. Yes. Are you sure that there is an S missing? Oh. Yes, there is. A, there is an S missing. So let's see. Oh, let's run this again. Okay. Two and one. Okay. Precondition condition number is is two. Thank you. Was there, was there an S missing before too? Yeah, boy. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. 